I'm Doug Fern, and this is my take on music recording. The first time I pressed the record button on an Ampex tape machine was in 1963. It was at my high school FM broadcast station. I was very fortunate that my high school had an FM broadcast station, which was low-powered and only covered the immediate area, but we ran it as if it were the most important radio station in the world. We were very fortunate to have excellent equipment. We had Ampex tape machines, RCA and Electro Voice microphones, a Collins console, and all the things we needed to make truly professional radio. The high school radio station also broadcast sporting events like basketball and football games. And we also broadcast performances by the high school students, such as the school orchestra or band, or even a talent show. On this day, I was recording the school orchestra in the school auditorium for later broadcast. I wasn't happy. It didn't sound good at all. I could not figure out why it didn't sound like what I thought it should sound like. My reference for music was the Philadelphia Orchestra performing in the Academy of Music in Philadelphia. My father played in the orchestra, and I often went to concerts and occasionally went with him to rehearsals. At the rehearsals, I could wander around the empty Academy of Music and listen to the orchestra from many different places, see how it sounded different in different places. Sometimes I would sit with him on stage and hear what the orchestra sounded like from the inside. My father did not like recorded music, and we never listened to it at home. In fact, we didn't even have a way to play a record at home. I was not exposed to recorded music until I was in high school. Of course, I heard it occasionally on the radio or on the television, but to me, I didn't relate to that as being music, because to me, music was something that was made in a concert hall. I wasn't used to hearing music coming out of loudspeakers, and I didn't really relate to it. But by the time I got to high school, I was exposed to recorded music, and I was fascinated with how it was made. I was not permitted to attend recording sessions with the Philadelphia Orchestra, but I could go there and watch while they were setting up. The orchestra did not record in the Academy of Music, which always baffled me, but instead recorded in a hotel ballroom a few blocks away. The record company producers and engineers thought that the Academy of Music had an insufficiently long reverberation time and preferred the sound of this much livelier ballroom. I saw how they set up the microphones, ran the cables, connected it to a recording console, and into tape machines. This was in the late 1950s, and tape was still relatively new, and stereo was newer still. The primary recording was still a monaural recording with one microphone placed high above the orchestra and out about 20 feet. They also set up a pair of spaced microphones which were used to feed a separate recorder which recorded the same performance in stereo. So my disappointment with my recording of the school orchestra was inevitable. For one thing, it wasn't the Philadelphia Orchestra, and for another, it wasn't the Academy of Music. The high school auditorium had abysmal acoustics. The room was made out of cinder block with a concrete floor. All the chairs were metal and wood. There were no absorptive surfaces whatsoever in the entire room except for the curtains on stage. But my recording didn't even sound as good as it sounded in the auditorium, and I couldn't figure out why. And in the 50-plus years since then, I'm still trying to make it sound better. I've made a lot of progress, but I still have to say I'm never fooled that something is live when it is actually recorded. It just doesn't sound the same to me. And that's okay, as I hope to explain in this series. We can use the visual arts as an analogy. Say photography. A photographer can take a snapshot of a scene, and that may be very effective in capturing what happened at that instant. But what if he or she spent some time composing the photograph, moved things around so there weren't distracting elements in the background? 
found a better vantage point, higher or lower or off to one side, that enhanced the vision that the photographer had of the scene. He could use lights or reflectors to change the lighting of the scene and improve the experience for the viewer. A composed photograph may lack the spontaneity of a snapshot, but it may be better in the long run for the person viewing the picture. The same can be said for recording. We can just set up a microphone and capture what's going on in the studio, or we can spend some time analyzing what's going on in there. Where does the music sound best? Where is the balance of all the instruments optimum? How can we use reflections of the sound in the room to enhance the sound? Or how can we minimize echoes of the sound in the room that are detracting from the sound? Both approaches to photography and recording are valid, but what's the most effective use of the medium for the viewer or listener? Taking this analogy one step farther, the photographer can use techniques that used to be done in the darkroom but are now done on a computer, to enhance or correct the photograph. She can manipulate the exposure, the lighting, the colors, crop the photo to eliminate distracting elements, and many other techniques to make a better presentation. Similarly, the engineer can use techniques in the studio to further enhance the recording. Choosing the best microphone for a particular instrument or voice can improve the sound of the recording. The engineer can use equalization, which is really just a more sophisticated form of the tone controls on your stereo system, to further enhance the recording or perhaps change the balance between the highs and lows in order to improve the effectiveness. Artificial reverberation can be added which will change the apparent acoustical environment where the music is performed. Audio compression can be added to reduce the dynamic range so that the loudest and the softest parts of the music are more equal in volume. This is particularly effective for recordings that are going to be heard in a noisy environment, such as a car. Taken to an extreme, a photographer can manipulate a photograph so that it doesn't look anything like the original subject. It can be a product of the creative mind that has little resemblance to the original scene. Or, taking that a step farther, they can abandon the photographic process altogether and use a different visual art, such as painting, to create a scene that doesn't exist in nature. The same can be done in recording. The sounds can be manipulated so they bear little resemblance to the original music. The result is an artistic expression that has little to do with the original sound that was produced. So we have two extremes. You can either make a recording or take a photograph that's a simple snapshot of what happened at that instant. Or we can manipulate it so it bears no resemblance to the original music. Recording in the 21st century falls somewhere in between these two extremes, but it does illustrate how we can manipulate sound to provide a more effective experience for the listener. We'll delve into these techniques in more details in the future, but this is just an overview to give you a sense of how these things are done. This is my take on music recording. I'm Doug Fern, and I'll see you next time.